if, if I ask you on the count of three, just to, I'm going to give you a second to think about it, but on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to tell me what is your favorite place. If I was going to say, hey, what's your favorite place? It may be, it may be a particular house. It may be just a, a you know, a, a place, uh, um, not a non-specific place, but kind of like, you know, I like to be at the lake or whatever. So if I was going to ask you on the count of three, what is, what is your favorite place? What would it be? So ready? One, two, three. Three. Okay, so we hear all different kinds of things. Some of it is a, some of it's a place. Some of it's with a certain person or a certain group of people. Some of it's in a recline. I heard somebody say recliner. Okay, so it can be all those different kind of things. And for some of you, your favorite place is wherever your family is, right? And 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 that's cool. Anybody here say jail, prison? <laughs> A big hole in the ground. The letter, the, the second letter that, that Paul wrote to Timothy, we call it 2 Timothy, it was written while Paul is in prison. And it's not, it's not a nice prison. It's not a federal penitentiary where you get to play golf and, and all that other stuff. It is basically an abandoned cistern, which means it's a, it's a well that you are lowered into by a rope. Anything that comes in and out of that comes in and out of that either by gravity or by a rope. This is where Paul has been put, and he's pretty sure he's not getting out of here alive, that this is, the, this is his last place. That's not his favorite place. But he knew that he was in the middle of God's will. And I used to say years ago, the safest place is to be in the middle of God's will. Well, I've, I've, I've changed that. The best place to be is in the middle of God's will. That doesn't make it the safest place. Because, because Paul knew, he knew from the first day that he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, uh, or the road to Emmaus, he, he knew that, that his life was going to be difficult. But he, but he also knew that his life was going to take on a, an entirely new purpose where he was going to get to talk to people, both Jew and Gentile, and eventually the head of the Roman government, which at that time was the head of the world. He was going to talk to the number one dude in all of the world. That was what he knew, and he loved being God's person, that God's ambassador, even though it was an ambassador in chains. So the reason I wanted to start with this is because as we go into 2 Timothy, I want you to think about if, if this was your last chance to write somebody a letter. If, you've, if you are writing from a prison cell that you don't, you don't deserve to be there, I mean, he had done nothing against the Roman government. He'd done nothing against, um, he'd done nothing against the Old Testament, but he had, he had infuriated enough people who were religious uh, and they had turned the, the political government against him. How would you write? Well, Timothy, I'm being treated bad. I'm just being treated. It's just horrible. The way I'm being treated, it's just horrible. I shouldn't be here. This is just, or woe's me. I'm just, I'm so, you know, or would, or would you be able to write that final letter the way we see Paul writing this final letter to Timothy, a very encouraging letter, a very instructive letter, a very emotional and passionate letter. I think that's just important for us to think about as we are talking about this last letter that Paul writes. Um, and we know that Paul wrote almost half of the, of the New Testament. Um, he wrote a lot of things, but this is the final thing that he's going to write. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, I don't know how far we'll get today, but we're going to at least get to verse 1. So here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. An apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. The attitude that Paul writes is not an attitude out of persecution. It's an attitude that he, and believing it was final, it is attitude of, I have been called by Jesus Christ to be an ambassador, to, to, to reach out to those around us. Um, if you remember the story, the story of Paul, it actually, his, his original name was Saul, and he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had been given basically a, a, a badge and a, and, a, and, a, 
piece of paper that said he could go anywhere this, the way was going. This, these people who were proclaiming Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He, he was allowed to go anywhere to, to, to break into people's houses, to, to take them off to jail. Um, and even he stood at the stoning of Stephen. So he even condoned, and, and he says that he, you know, he was responsible for the death of some of the believers in his day. So this is who he was, and all of a sudden he's going, and he is struck blind by, uh, by, by the Lord, by the Lord's presence. He's struck blind, and, uh, and, he, and he responds. And we see this in Acts chapter 9, um, in Acts chapter 9. And then after he meets face to face with Yeshua, um, he, he goes and he, and he kind of hides out because now everybody's looking for him. The church doesn't trust him and the religious people are wanting to find out what in the world is going on with you. And so he's in hiding. And in Acts chapter nine, verses 10 through 16, God is going to send somebody to him. And here's, here it is. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am. And the Lord said to him, rise up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of, of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen, a vision, he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And Ananias is thinking, couldn't he have had a vision with somebody named Bob that came in? Couldn't he have had a vision where somebody named, you know, Susie came in? But no, he's had a vision. Literally, the, the Holy Spirit is speaking to Ananias and saying, he's had a vision that you're going to come in. He doesn't, he doesn't, he hasn't seen you because he's blind and you're going to go in and you're going to pray for him. And then it goes on. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Let me get this straight. You want me to go in your name to the guy who could arrest me because I'm using your name and you want me to pray for him. And the Lord is saying, that's exactly what I want, to, I want you to do. The Lord said, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. That's not just Paul. That's not just Saul. We are all called by his name to proclaim the gospel to the people who we are in, in, in relationship with. That, that's a calling that we all share. So Ananias, should I go? Yes, you should go. But watch what he says in verse 16. I will show him. Who's speaking? The Holy Spirit is speaking. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Day one, assignment day one, he, he's going to find out from the Holy Spirit, I, I'm redeeming you and and I'm going to let you know the, the way you're going to have to suffer throughout your life to do the very thing that I've called you to do. Is there suffering for the Christian? Is there suffering for the believer? Well, yes. I mean, we're just called into it. Now, I know that th this, Sally and I were talking about this yesterday. By the way, Sally's not here. She's, she's, She's sitting with Lily. Lily is very sick, and her mom and dad were, were leading worship somewhere, and so she's there. Um, but, but Sally and I were talking about it. It's like, you know, we talk about persecution. We talk about hardship. We talk about suffering. Is it all the same thing? Is it all just one big umbrella? Is it, is it different things? Let's, let's just be real. We live in a fallen world, and the fallen world, because there's sin in the fallen world, there's stuff like cancer. There's stuff like, there's stuff like depression. There's, there's all this stuff that wasn't part of God's plan, but, but now we deal with it. Everybody deals with it. Believer and non-believer deal with different things. But then as a believer, there are things that come on us because we are believers in Jesus Christ. And sometimes those, those lines can get kind of blurred. Now, you can be the kind of person who believes every time you stub your toe, it's an attack, an attack of the enemy. Or you, can or you can be on the other extreme where nothing happens even when you, you, you are, you know, you've been stricken by some rare disease. Well, that's, that's not, that's not uh, spiritual, that's just physical. I think most of us fall somewhere in between where we realize that some of the stuff that hits us is, is just because we live in a fallen world. And some of it is an absolute spiritual attack. 
What we're talking about here is that Paul was told from day one that as you are my disciple, you will suffer for carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's important for me to say to all of y'all, because as, as your pastor, I don't want anybody to go one day, wait a minute, Pastor Mike told me it would be all gumdrops and roses if I, if I followed Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus himself doesn't say that, so I'm not going to say that. So, so from day number one, Saul, who now is Paul, knows that he is going to have a rough go of it. Then Acts 21, verses 10 through 13. Uh, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and his hands. Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentile. I don't think this is the only time that Paul gets a, gets a, re, a, a reminder from the Holy Spirit that, look, as long as you are doing what I've called you to do, there's going to be struggle. There's going to be there's going to be st- hard times. There is going to be persecution. If you follow me, there is going to be persecution. And Paul, I want you to follow me. And so this guy Agabus takes, he walks in. We don't know that he knows that it's Paul's belt. I'm, I'm assuming if he took it off of Paul, everybody would know it was Paul's belt. We, we don't know any of that, but, but he does that. And then what do the people do? They go, look, Paul, it's bad. You can't go. Don't go. Whatever you do, you got to run. You got to turn. You got to go. Um, when we, heard, when we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am not only ready to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He's ready for prison. He's ready for death because he lives out of the life in Christ Jesus that he's been called into. Again, this is not a bit, you know, this, if you're doing marketing, you're going to leave this part out. You know, we want to get as many people in as we can. So leave out the part where there's going to be persecution. Paul was like, no, no. As long as I have called and been called to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, whatever, I'm ready for prison. I'm ready for death. I'm ready to be disinvited from the, my favorite get, to, get alongs. I, I'm, I'm ready to lose that promotion. I'm, I'm ready to have people when I walk into a room, turn and walk the other direction. I am ready because I would rather follow Christ than be, than be adored by people. I, I would rather follow Christ than never have a single problem in my life because I'm following Christ Jesus. So Holy Spirit or Jesus talked, uh, talked to, uh, to Paul and told him what you had to look forward to. This guy Agabus and other people probably have done it. And then Acts chapter 23. This is all preparation so we get our mind where Paul's mind might have been. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. So not only did God tell him and encourage him in the fact that, look, when you come under persecution, don't think it's because you're doing something wrong. It's actually because you're doing something right, and, and it's okay. You're going to go through this, but I'm going to be with you, and we're going to go through and then other people. But here, here we see the Holy Spirit come into him and go, man, look, I have something. You, you, you think you, you're, you're thinking you might just die right here in this spot, but let me tell you, I have plans for you. My plan is that you are going to go speak in Rome. You're going to get to have an audience with the top dog. That's going to happen. And from that on, from that time on, Paul was like, <clears throat> you know, somebody's like, man, you, you probably need to get that cough checked out. He goes, nah, I'm, I'm good. God has told me I'm going to go to Rome. Well, you better, you better watch out. You know, you, I mean, Paul was like, look, I can throw myself off a cliff. I might be bru- bruised and broken, but I know I'm going to Rome because God has told me I'm going to Rome. What has God told you about your life? What has God told you about your future? What has God told you that he has planned for you? Because some of you can go, well, I actually, I know the Lord has actually spoken to me about a, about a mission that he has for me, and I've not completed it yet. I love that pastor said one time, he said, you know, um, um, it, it, God works all things, you know, to the good. 
And you're thinking, well, I've got some things that have not been worked to the good. Well, okay, then let me tell you, God's not finished working, okay? Because he does what he says he's going to do. So all of this is going on. I'm not going to go into, because we got the, you got the younger folks in here today. And so, uh, you know, from time to time, I say stuff I shouldn't. Um, I'm trying to really be good about that. But there was a guy named Nero. Uh, Nero, uh, what do we know about? We, we, we think of he was a fiddler, right? But apparently the fiddle was not even invented then. I don't know. But w what we know is that Nero was a corrupt government leader. We don't know nothing about that. Corrupt government leader. And he wanted to renovate parts of Rome. And the Senate that he worked through said, no, we're not going to sign that document so that you can spend money. We don't have to rebuild buildings that are fine. And Nero said, oh, that's fine. And then Nero, according to history, set fires to where a majority of Rome was burned so that now they have to renovate. Well, Nero was smart enough to know, well, I don't want to be the one who's blamed for the, for the burnings. And so he, he, points, he points it to the Christians. It was those Christians burning down stuff. Does that sound at all familiar to what we're going on, what's going on in our society today? It's like, let's tear something down and then let's blame it on those Christian people. Okay, so that's, that's what happens. And so it makes sense now that Nero is like, okay, I, is the, every Christian I kill now gets me, some, gets me some political clout with these people. Nero, we believe, is the one who will eventually have Paul beheaded. Okay, so this is, this, why am I saying all this stuff? Because if I was Paul, I would be mad, sad, Weepy, moany, gripey. I would, I would be all of, I would be all of the little dwarfs except Sneezy. I mean, I would be all of them, and I would think, you know, I'm going to write Timothy a letter. Dear Timothy, quit now. Ministry is hard, and then you die. The end. I mean, that's how I would have written this. But why did Paul not write it that way? Because Paul got it. It's not about persecution. It's about. It's about following the example of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ let himself be put on a cross so that you and I could have salvation. Amen. That's a pretty good deal. Okay? So now let's, uh, let's see if we can get farther in this. Chapter 1, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. If I were going to write, um, if I were going to write Michael a, a letter, and I'll just say, my, because a lot of times I do this when I text people, especially if I'm afraid they, they don't know who I am or I assume they don't know who I am. Hey, this is Mike Pesall. I, I If I was going to write that, I, I could go, hey, Michael, it's Mike Pesall. I wouldn't have to go, hey, Michael, it's Mike Pesall, pastor, Gateway Christian Center, father of six beautiful children, four wonderful son-in-laws, and soon to be nine beautiful grandchildren, more girls than boys, and I'm excited about that. I wouldn't need to do that. Why? Because Michael knows who I am. If I was going to write a letter to my wife, I, I wouldn't even have to add my name, Right? Why has Paul put that, that whole moniker in there? Because Paul means for everyone to read this letter. Yes, it is a personal letter to Timothy, but it's a personal letter that is supposed to be shared with you and with me. So as you read this, go, well, okay, that was for Timothy. That's not for me. Paul would not have told you who he was if it wasn't meant for you and for me to read. To Timothy, my beloved child. Now, we know that Paul almost always says what? Grace and peace. Grace and peace. What does he add this time? Mercy. Because he knows Timothy needs mercy. Timothy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and tell you right now, you need mercy. See, grace is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. No. That, I had that backwards. Mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. He adds mercy in there because it's important. 
It's important for Paul and Timothy in their relationship and for our relationship to remember mercy is very, very important. So grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Paul Very excited about this. Verse 4, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Now, this goes back to, um, you know, Paul has left Timothy there. Timothy is, is, um, Timothy's father was Greek. Timothy's mother and grandmother were Jewish. Um, Timothy, when he was brought into the ministry, they, Paul had him circumcised so that as he dealt with those religious Jews, that would be one less uh, stumbling block in their relationship. He didn't do the same thing with Titus, but, he, but he's done that. Um, but at some point, Paul has said to Timothy, Timothy, I need you to stay here and run this because I have to go on ahead. And, and I'm sure that if Timothy were as closely related to Paul as we believe that they were, Timothy also understood that, Paul, you're not just leaving me here. You're leaving me here for some place that I wish you didn't have to go. You're leaving me here for something. And, and so Timothy's tears, we don't see that as a weakness. We see that as a, as a sign of, of compassion and love that Timothy had for Paul. And so he says, I remember, I remember those tears. I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Literally being back together, Paul knew would just be a huge blessing to him. Okay, we talked about this a little bit last week. There are those of us who are raised in in a religious setting, in in a in a religious environment where we were told any emotion is bad, too much emotion is bad. There, but when I when I talk about certain people in my family and certain topics, I'm going to get emotional. You know why? Because. My emotions are connected to what I'm thinking. My emotions are connected to what I believe. My emotions are connected to that relationship. And so as I talk about these things, I'm going to get emotional about it. Uh, I, I actually, you know, I cry at some of the Budweiser commercials They're back back in the day when they were good with the with the puppy and the dog and the horse and all this other stuff. I mean, I would shed a little tear, you know. I, I can be... A, Stop being told, stop accepting the fact when people tell you, look, there is nothing emotional about a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you really have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it will wreck you emotionally. I mean, you just just take in, you were dead and now you're not dead. You were blind and now you're not blind. That would make you a little emotional. So a true experience will have emotion. Now, Mike, but I'm not an emotional person. Well, let me just encourage you. Maybe you're not an emotional person because you've been told not to be emotional, that that's silly, that it's ridiculous. Maybe you're you're not an emotional person because you're afraid to let go, okay? Let me just encourage you. We serve a God who, if you read the description of God, God's God's pretty emotional, okay? So it's okay. I'm, I'm not saying I want you to cry all the time or on cue. I hate that. But, but be willing to be, be vulnerable to emotion. Um, it can be pretty, pretty good. Okay. Verse five, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I am sure dwells in you as well. So here's the reason I was asking the kids about old age and stuff like that. um, We, our culture doesn't tend to honor people who are older. There are cultures, there are cultures around the world that really do honor older people. Uh, As a general rule, we tend not to, but, but did you hear Did you hear grandma's role in Timothy's salvation? Mom's role in Timothy's salvation. If you are a a grandmother, grandfather age, you are, you know, your job isn't done. You are speaking life into your children, into your grandchildren, into your great-grandchildren, into somebody else's children. My my accountability partner, Jack Keller. Jack uh, Jack and Lisa are... are, um, uh, surrogate grandparents to some some friends of theirs have young kids and they go to they go when it's grandparents day at those kids schools they go 
Now, it's funny because I, I, I think there, um, I think the, the family, if, I probably have this wrong, but I think there is some, uh, some different race, uh, race in there. And so they look, whatever that race is. And Jack is very tall and very white. So I'm sure when he walks in as grandpa, you know, it's probably like, mm, I don't know about that. But you can be a surrogate grandparent for somebody spiritually. Our job is not over as long as you're here on this side, breathing. You have something that you can be doing. That's very encouraging. Verse 6 and 7, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Um, the, the whole idea about fanning into flame... Um, how many of y'all love to have a good uh, bonfire outside? I, I know I know the Hatleys just built a fire ring. We, how many? I, I love. Or how many of y'all have an actual fireplace in your house? Okay. Now, do you just you start the fire, you get it going, and then you just let it just do 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 do, and then eventually it goes out? Does anybody do that? I mean, it's fine. I know eventually you have to go to bed. But how many of y'all, like me, every time it starts to dim a little bit, you go over and you just poke it, and you're fanning. Why? Because I want a flame. I, I, don't, I don't want embers. I want a flame. It's not, just about, it's not just about fanning the flame that's almost gone out. It's not just about fanning those coals and trying to, to, to get the fire to come back one more time. It's about keeping it going. Keeping it going, keeping it going. I, I love, uh, I love s'mores. I'm sorry, I just do. I like s'mores, and every time the grandkids come over and we have a fire, you know, that's we want to we want to do the s'mores. And the last time I got those huge marshmallows, save your money, those are horrible. But um, <laughs> but you know what? The, I I know where to I know where to get. I, I don't like mine on fire. Like my wife, she like burns. It's like, why do you do that? Okay, Jill's agreeing. Never mind. But <laughs> I like to find that place where the heat is just right, you know, and, and, I, and, and all that. Somebody is watching you, and I want to encourage you to seek to be fanned into flame. Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to kind of cruise and I'm just going to coast. And I, I don't, I don't really want to be on fire for the Lord. I just want to be warm for the Lord, be on fire for the Lord. Be on fire for the Lord because that's what he needs us to be. That's what he needs us to be. So uh, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame. Verse, verses 8 through 12, and then uh, I'm going to spend just a minute here, and then we'll, uh, we'll be done. Verses 8 through 12. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor, uh, nor of me, his prisoner. Now, I think there's some hidden stuff here. I think that eventually Paul got put in jail and run out of town enough that even those people who supported him at one time said, man, uh, Paul must be doing something wrong because he keeps getting in trouble. Paul probably from some groups, not just the people who opposed him, but even the people who followed him, at some, po at some point they begin to think, you know, they're, 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 you know, he keeps getting in trouble. He must have done something wrong. Persecution is persecution. Don't, 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 when you're looking at somebody who you, you, man, they've really been persecuted a lot. Make sure that you don't start doing what people were doing, I think, to Paul, and you begin to judge, well, those people they must have done something wrong. They must have, their motivation must have been wrong. Don't be in the judging business, okay? That's, that's, that's what I'm encouraging you there. So he said, um, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now he has been, uh, and, and which now he has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I am appointed to a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. 
I stopped, I stopped at 12. I'm, I'm calling it 12a. There are 50 verses in, the, in this letter. I mean, it's 50 sentences, okay, not verses. But um, Paul, Paul is the king of run-on sentences. You know what I mean? He can, he can make a sentence go, you know, that could, I, could, I could, you know, probably get it out a little bit shorter. But, but he does these run-on. There's only 50 sentences in this, in this verse, in, in this letter. And, and it made me think as I was preparing for it, it's like, what if you taught it by sentence instead of by idea or by, by verse? And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do. And I take this big sentence here. Um, and I stopped it where I did because I think that's where, where he stops the sentence. But here's what I think has happened in, in, in the church is we've rewritten that. Paul is saying all of this stuff, uh, uh, don't be ashamed of me, the testimony of the Lord. Uh, we've been saved as uh, and called uh, to holy calling. All these things... There are, there are some that say, okay, if you do all those things, then ta-da, never another problem in your life. Ta-da, no more suffering. Ta-da, it's perfect from here on out. It's clear sailing. It's all these things. They, they miss the fact that he says all this incredible stuff about the power of Jesus Christ in our life. And he goes, and that's why I suffer the way I do. Mike, this is the least encouraging message ever. <laughs> Here's why it's encouraging. Because Paul, if a, if a guy from inside a cistern writing his, what he probably knows is his last letter to, to, um, to, to a son and the faith that he really, really loves, and he's able to remember all this cool stuff about his salvation, you and I have no excuse to forget this cool stuff about our salvation. Um, and so I want to, I just want to, I, I want to restate it. Um, I know that I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I know that I'm blessed and highly favored. I know that Jesus purchased healing with my stripes. With all that being said, those things that I know, I also know that what Jesus says in John and then again in Matthew, John 15, 18 through 21 says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you, were the, if you were of the world, the world would love you as your own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things that will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. As we read that scripture, and then this morning, this, the, my, one of my scriptures this morning was from Matthew chapter 5, which is the blessed, uh, and, and um, verse 11 and 12, um, blessed are you when others revile and persecute you. Jesus started his whole ministry by saying, look, if you follow me, you're going to make people unhappy. People are, people are going to resist you because they resist me. So here's how I kind of... Um, I kind of rewrote the, the, the eight, verses 8 through uh, 12a. This is why I suffer as I do. This is why I will not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of this prison, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, because he saved us, and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He appointed me a preacher, an apostle, and teacher." Everything we do is from the overflow of what Jesus has done. We love out of the overflow of his love. We forgive out of the overflow of his forgiveness. We show mercy out of the overflow of his mercy. We sacrifice through persecution out of the overflow of his sacrifice for us. In him, we live, 
we breathe, we exist. I want to give you this word of encouragement today. And, and it really is a word of encouragement. If you, if you have been, if you are under the impression that as long as you follow Jesus, you're never going to have, you're never going to have any problems, that denies what Jesus said himself as he, as he brought in disciples. If you follow me and if you do what I call you to do, people are going to be, they're, they're going to, they're going to go against you. But there are many who will follow you and will also enjoy the redemption that you are now re enjoying. And that's, that's, that's the exciting part. Um, there was a, a story I knew about a, a guy, and he, he said it was a true story. I assume it was. He was talking about how his grandfather, um, his grandfather had gotten quite older and had a hard time walking. And uh, he was on the farm with his grandfather, and they would go down to this river where they would, and I was out in Colorado, they would go down to this river and they would, they would fish. And, um, and so his grandfather uh, told him, as he set him up at, at one point, and he said, he goes, look, the only thing I want you to do is I want you to really watch out, because there, there are a lot of water snakes, and these water snakes, I don't want you to get bit, so whatever you do, be very, very careful. If you, if you have a problem, you call me. And so... You know, little, you know, the, this guy began to fish and, and grandfather went about, you know, 100, 200 feet away, just enough to, to kind of get their, their, get their spots uh, separate. And, um, and then the, the, the grandfather's over there and he, he's casting. And, um, and then all of a sudden his, his grandson, um, he hooks a big fish. But in his excitement, the way he called out, it didn't sound to the grandfather like, hey, I've caught a big fish. It was, he interpreted it more of, hey, there's a big snake about to eat my head. Whatever, whatever, whatever this, this guy said, whatever he said, what his grandfather heard was, I need to get there. And he said, he said, I felt so bad as I looked and I saw my grandfather hobble and, and just, just made, he made that, that run as fast as he could because, okay, sometimes when we move to a position of ministry, when we move in to rescue the perishing, when we come in to help those people that are lost, it may be difficult, it may be uncomfortable, it may be a struggle, but just like that grandfather did for that child, his love for that child was so much, he didn't care how much it was going to injure him. It didn't, he didn't care what it was going to cost him. If we love the way Jesus loves, we'll stop worrying about all the things we have to go through to share Jesus's love. We'll just go, you know what? <laughs> Jesus has loved me so much. If, if person A is going to hate me, but person B is going to all going to come to know the Lord, I'm okay with person A hating me. If person C is going to try to do everything they can do to, to, to ruin my reputation, I'm still going to get to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to person B. I am willing to receive whatever negative so that I can go and give the ultimate positive. This is what we're going to see. Paul is encouraging Timothy again as we go through uh, this month, as we look at the, the rest of the letter of, of 2 Timothy. I hope you'll be praying for me and I'll be praying for you guys. Um, and uh, we're going to have an incredible time as we learn through this. So let's be dismissed in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for our warriors being in service today. They've been so good, and I know they've come up with some beautiful artwork. And uh, for their moms and dads and grandma and grandpa and just all of us being here, Holy Spirit, what is it you have for us to do today? Who is there in our path this week that we can speak the love of Jesus to? Who is it this week in our path that we can just show by the way we react and interact that we have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that we love because he first loved, because we show mercy because he first showed mercy, because we are kind and compassionate because he first was kind and compassionate to us. We have been, we have been overflowed with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we ask Jesus, who do you want us to slosh on this week? Who do, you, who do you just want us to slosh on this week as we walk through the grocery stores and the workplace and schools and everywhere else that you put us? We are your servants. 
and we want you to use us. We love you, and we pray that you would bless us, bless all those who are struggling right now with whatever. God, you are the one who meets every need. We love you, and we say in the name above every name, Jesus, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Kids.